Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let me start with good morning to all of you. Gosh, I look out and I see so many people I know, I love, I've shared life with here at Holy Name of Mary. And I'm really grateful that Father John asked me to be here today to talk to you about grief and loss. And it's something that I love to talk about. And I do every month here at Holy Name of Mary. Uh, hello, welcome. Uh, with our ongoing grief support. Okay, so we've offered grief support here for about 10 years. I've been a staff member since 2009, and I've volunteered here since 1985. Oh, wow. I know. It's my home parish. I was born here, and I'm going to continue to serve and serve our community well. So this morning, we're going to do a lot of uh, talking about grief. And I titled my talk Grief 101, and there is no test after. <laughs> no test, I promise. Um, and we're going to go over all these different aspects of grief. There's so many aspects. Let's see what Nagi wants to do. Okay. <clears throat> Is there a magic button? Or? No, it, this is the wrong microphone because you need to have it at least 12 inches. Right here? Yeah. Can you hear me now? No. 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 Oh, okay. It's off, I think. Is it on? No, it's off. No, he has that. He took the speaker off. <clears throat> okay, keep, keep trying. How is that? That's, yeah. that's is that better? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds better to me, yeah. too. Yeah. Much better. I feel. I don't have it ringing in my ear. So I uh, wanted to start and talk to you a little bit about what I do here. Many of you know. Oh, let me let me go back. Thank you, Marilyn. I know when I get into the bulk and the meat of our discussion today, you're going to have a lot of questions. So let's wait uh, till the end to do our questions um, and anything you may want to ask at the end. I'm happy to do that with you because a lot of this is going to maybe generate a little bit of curiosity in you and that's perfectly and that's what I want you to be able to feel with grief is curiosity and a lot of this will be a lot of self-reflection also so again we can do our questions at the end okay all right so let me just define a little bit about what I do here. I, uh, so I am the funeral uh, coordinator. I help direct our funerals. I meet our bereaved families. Um, and I'm something called a thanatologist. Thana, T-H-A-N-A, -A, thanatologist. And that's someone who studied uh, death, dying, and bereavement. And I didn't choose this job, it really chose me. I uh, didn't think I was going to be in this role, right? Coming out of college, I was an art student, not, not ever thinking I would be here. And a lot of it had to do with the way I grieved the death of my father at 53. And he died from sleep apnea. So it was Parish Festival weekend. We had spent the whole weekend here at festival, said goodbye Sunday night. By Monday morning, he was gone. Oh, wow. And so I grieved very rationally. Uh, in my work in art, art history, I read. And what did I naturally do? Read. That, this is how I coped. And that's how I found my way to thanatology. So I'm a thanatologist, I'm licensed, and I help others navigate grief. And finishing up right now is my licensed professional counselor, pastoral counseling in grief. And so that should be about next year because I'm doing all my hours right now. Uh, so I love what I do and I love talking about this. And we're gonna start by turning over our packet and really starting to dive in. So we're going to start Grief 101 and I'm just gonna first say that grief uh, makes us crazy, right? Grief unsettles us in so many ways, so many aspects. The word crazy comes from a 14th century word called crazen, okay? And crazen means to shatter, to break. That's where crazy comes from. And the, before that, there was the, the Norse word krasen. So it comes from this long life to break. 
And you know in pottery, especially fine china, where there's crazing on the china with all those little tiny cracks? Because there's tension, right, in the glaze, and you see all those fine little cracks? Crazen, crazy, craze, uh, craza, the Norse word, all derives from there. So grief makes us feel shattered. The word bereavement is, is a beautiful, it's a beautiful word. It means to be grieved, to be torn apart, to be torn in two. So to be grieved means your whole world has been now different. It's shattered, right? Nothing will ever be the same. To be grieved. And so these are really important words as we go through this for you to remember uh, because it all will come back to how we use them in our daily language even now. So in bereavement. So let's start with how do we define grief? Let's start there. So grief is an ongoing, evolving, natural human experience. It involves a cognitive, emotional, physical, and behavioral process to grief. Okay? So they could be responses to death and non-death losses. Okay, so loss of jobs, loss of mobility, loss of health, loss of a pet, loss of a friendship or a relationship. Those are, that was all tied to grief, okay? So no, it's not just emotional. Grief changes our behavior. It has physical manifestations in our body relational changes within our family dynamics, right? We know that when, especially a death occurs in families, families go in all sorts of directions, right? It brings out maybe pathological behaviors in families. Um, everyone's dealing with the grief in different ways, okay? Um, it also brings up secondary losses, and I'm gonna be talking about that later today. It talks, um, it, it changes the way we look at the world, um, our sense of security in the world. It really shifts everything in how we think. Okay, so change is the core. And do we like change? We don't like change. And we don't like, especially when we lose somebody in a death, because our whole identity changes. Our own identity changes. So know that grieving and mourning are two separate things. Grieving is everything that's internal. It would be the ruminating about the loss, how the person died. It's everything we keep inside of us, ourselves. The things we don't say aloud. That's grieving. We are really, really good at grieving. Mourning, completely different. Mourning is the outward expression of loss. Mourning is grief um, on the outside. Mourning is crying. Mourning is talking about our loved one. Mourning would even be wailing in some cultures. Mourning is throwing yourselves on top of the casket. Mourning is looking through pictures of your loved ones, listening to all their favorite songs, watching videos of your loved one, right? Mourning is the key essential piece in the softening of grief. But because we're Western culture, American culture specifically, we don't mourn well because we don't know how to do it. And we're also a society that is very keen on doing things on our own. I can take care of this. I got this. No, don't worry. I can handle it. Grief calls us, it pulls us out of that. We, we cannot do it alone. Grief needs community, even though for those of us who are introverted. Grief, call, we are called, right, even as disciples. Christ teaches that in a very early church. We're called to do things as, as community, and grief is one of those big things. One of those big things. So no grieving and mourning are separate and different, and most of us are better at grieving, keeping it inside, not talking about it, stuffing it in. Right? Mourning, outward expression of loss. Good for you to know. Good for you to know that. Because when someone's authentically mourning, what that person needs from you as family and friends is to be a good listener, to be a well of listening, right? To have an open heart and to be there for them. And make no judgment. Not try to fix it. Not try to make it better. 
not try to say, let's get through it or find the joy too quickly. You just listen, okay? Grief is also something called the downward movement of the soul. Let me say that again. The downward movement of our souls. We're called to call, go inward. We're called to be just go inside of ourselves naturally. That's what we do. We go down before we come back up. And we do that too with death losses in relationships. We go backwards in relationship with our loved one. And for those of you who've lost soulmates, know that you did that just naturally when you lost your husband, wife, partner. We go backwards in relationship to that with them and we start at the love story. We do that also when we lose a child. We go backwards in relationship. We were the love story, when we first conceived, when we first adopted them, whenever they came into our lives, however they came into our lives, right? So know that grief makes us go backwards. It's called backwards work. Mm -hmm. So here's some general truths about grief. Gosh, and there's a lot of misconceptions about grief and universal truths. So truth one, grief is not uniform, okay? Grief does not follow a set of stages. There's no uniformity. There is no timeline. Grief is not linear. Grief doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end. Okay? And we carry loss and grief forward with us in ways unique to our lives. Grief also, just so you know, um, what helps one of you may not necessarily help another because it's highly individualized and unique. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, grief also, it's not something we overcome. Grief is something we need to go through. But grief is a lot of ways we like to go around it because we don't want to touch that pain, right? We don't want to go what's in the unknown in our grief. Uh, there's a beautiful study about buffalo. And th this is about grief, and this is how it, it all kind of, um, for us to, to know about buffalo. Researchers started noticing that buffalo herds would run into these major storms. They would run into them as a, as a herd. So there's a huge storm coming. Rather than the buffaloes trying to go around it, outrun it, they would go headstrong into it. And buffalo do that so they can just get through it faster. Isn't that amazing? That that's how they cope. They go right into it and take it on as a herd. Again, as a herd. Yeah. So that's some just general truths about grief. And I know you've also all heard the five stages of grief, right? By Elizabeth Cooper Ross, right? Know that when Elizabeth wrote those five stages, she was writing them for the dying. She wrote them as what she, as a hospice nurse, what she saw with patients as they died. Okay, so there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. Those are the five stages Elizabeth kind of laid out for us. And again, those were meant for the dying. Okay, but when the public got a hold of it, Right? Because we want to make sense, we want things to be linear, we want to have order, we took them and made them the five stages of grief. And then Elizabeth went back and rewrote them to accommodate the five stages of grief. Isn't that amazing, right? So no, there's no, there's no getting over this. It softens. It may not be as acute in time. You know, grief usually looks like this in the beginning, right? This is early grief, this is grief the first year, this is grief the second year, even a little bit in the third year. And when you do your work with grief, it softens. It does this. It's more gentle. You're still going to have low days, especially anniversaries, right? Birthdays, special days. But know that those days are going to be a little bit more gentle on you. It won't feel so cute. So let's talk about truth number two. No two people grieve the same way, right? So we, brother, sister, husband, wife, 
right? We, uh, friends, we don't breathe the same, okay? And this is why. One is it has to do with the unique relationship you had to the person who died. So that could be close, it could have been distant, it could have been complicated, you could have been dependent or independent of that person, you could have been very close, or eh, I'll see you just on holidays, right? Also, it's situational, so it's your past history of trauma or loss, right? How did you deal with loss growing up? What factors, how did your family of origin, what did your family do, and how did they talk about grief? Was it something you talked about, or something you never mentioned again? As a child, did you get to go to funerals, or were you just kind of told about it and you had to stay home? Right? That's a big factor in how we grieve. Uh, your experience at the time of loss, were you a caregiver? Were you caregiving for the loved one who died? Wow, that, that makes a big difference in grief. What other stressors do you have in your life? Right? What's your baseline mental health? That's a base, that's a big factor with our, our grief. Uh, what's your grief style? What's your coping style? You know, are you reactive? Are you responsive? You know, when we're reactive to our emotions, we just kind of whatever's there gets projected out. And when we're responsive, we're a little bit more careful in what we say and how we say it, and then we share it. So those are two ways as well. We also need in these especially personality, introvert, extrovert, optimist or pessimist. Um, we also, because we are usually somewhere in between introvert, extrovert, even optimist, pessimist, we need to be open to the way other people grieve. We, we often want people to grieve like we grieve, or we expect them to be grieving the way we are grieving. But we have to let those expectations fall. We need to let them all fall away because there is no right way to grieve. There's no wrong way to grieve, okay? All right, so let's talk about coping styles because I want to talk about that and I want you just to reflect. There's, I have a little worksheet later on for you to reflect on coping styles. So let me start with intuitive grievers. Okay, there's that first one. And this is really, I put, how society expects grief to be. Okay, so this is grief experienced as waves of emotion. Grief expression mirrors inner feelings and emotions. So that's that outward display of crying, um, wanting to connect with people, um, needing comfort, they explore their feelings and expressing their feelings. And intuitive grievers want to process their emotions. Okay, they need a lot of time for that as well. They need community, but then they need time apart. Now, instrumental grievers are very different. Okay, so let me, let me talk about an instrumental griever. So usually they're definitely more cognitive. So they're conscious of maybe thinking, reading, remembering, processing the loss in that way. Um, they definitely want to be more about problem solving, actively responding to grief. Um, they want to do something more physical. Maybe they want to organize an event, right? Maybe it's your parents, you lost your parents, and they're the ones who want to organize the home and get ready to kind of, you know, either downsize or sell everything. So instrumental and intuitive grievers are different. And we often lie, There's, we aren't either or, we're kind of in the middle as being instrumental and intuitive grievers. We go back and forth in that realm. Uh, but some individuals will, and it's nothing wrong with this, be more one than the other. I, I, I definitely want to know, but you know, it's not black and white, it's gray, okay? So you can identify like, yeah, this would be more me, and this has been me as I've had losses in my life, or you could be more instrumental, perfectly fine, both are normal, um, and just know that this is usually how we tend to grieve, okay? And then um, you see the optimist and pessimistic styles. So there were two researchers, and I put their names here, Kenneth Doka and Terry Martin, 
And they started their research in grief originally to, to research the gender of grief. So how women grieve and how men grieve. Okay, and in the course of their research and study, they started to see different things. And it was about optimistic people and pessimistic people. There again, I'm gonna say this, no right way and no wrong way. And I wanna give you the differences about in grief, how we grieve in this continuum. Okay, so as optimistic grievers, usually these individuals, things, in your world happen by chance, okay? It's un life is unpredictable. Uh, optimistic grievers, um, they don't really deny how terrible the loss was. I'm not saying this is being toxic, having maybe toxic positivity. I'm just saying that life is unpredictable. Things happen in the world. People get sick, people die, right? That's kind of a worldview. Um, they also, with grief, they're also more, the, their thinking is like, this is temporary, right? It's gonna get better in time. Um, it will always be with me. It won't have a permanent effect. Um, and I will, might have a meaningful, full life again. That's what optimistic grievers tend to see, okay? Again, not wrong, not right. Whereas pessimistic grievers, it's a little different. So they often pessimistic, if you're a pessimistic griever, you would be using kind of all or nothing language. Life is never gonna get better. I'm never gonna have connection again. I'm never going to be able to love again, have a normal life, get out of my pajamas, right? Get on with the day. Pessimistic grievers ha usually have very strong language. They also, though, see the world is different, as if this was meant to be. I deserve this in my life. So, no, you are a little bit of both there. You're usually kind of in the middle. But when pessimistic grievers just have a little bit harder time getting through grief. And so when I meet or work with a pessimistic griever, I have to interject language like both and and say yes right now it feels awful and terrible and it hurts and you want to have life again yes and then i have to instill hope and right you're going to make life meaningful again i don't know when that's going to happen but i can say it will happen in time so pessimistic grievers just have a little bit more uh, intentional work to do to make sure that they are interjecting those, it's not this just, you know, never, it's always language. It's going, it's both. And we have to kind of interject that into their, into their vocabulary, into their way of thinking. So if you're more pessimistic in grief, and you can think about how you've maybe felt or even feel now, you can see, oh, I need to do a little bit more, more work in this, um, in these realms. And no, it's, these aren't fixed traits. I want you to know that. Um, these are learned, they're, they, can, they can be changed. Um, we aren't born being either, either optimistic or pessimistic. These are learned traits. Uh, one of the researchers, his name is Martin Seligman, he did a, a big study in this about being optimistic and pessimistic. And he learned that, we, we learn them as children we learn them from our adults in our life. We learn them through experiences. We constantly are learning them. So we're not born into being either or, okay? So let's go to the next page and just look at truth number three. And know that you can grieve the loss of anything significant to you, okay? So anything, so that's maybe an estrangement Maybe you're, you stop talking to someone in your life and you haven't talked to them in a long time. You could grieve that relationship and that person. Uh, you've retired and you missed your old life. You miss going to a job every day. You miss the interaction, going to lunch, taking your lunch, right? Having that freedom. That's a loss as well. Moving, another loss. Moving, up and up, upending your community or um, leaving a neighborhood, maybe you've lived in a neighborhood for 30, 40 years, and you have to downsize and move. Oh, that's a huge loss. That 
that's a big one. So know that it's not always death losses. These are non-death losses and just as hard. The grief can be just as palpable as losing someone. And then truth four, grief is multifaceted and impacts many of life's domains. So that means grief impacts our emotions. It impacts our physical, our physical well-being. And grief is so physical. So for those of you in grief or ongoing grief, and let's go back to very early grief. In early grief, it's highly stressful, right? Our body's pumping out adrenaline, cortisol, stress hormones, right? It makes us tense. We have a lot of problems like in the jaw, in the back of the neck, right? Tops of the shoulders. You might find yourself like this at the end of the day, right? You might feel it in your back, the back of your legs. Um, grief is also felt in our tummies. Grief impacts our tummies. So terribly, right? You have, you don't have an appetite. You only want to eat certain things, right? You don't want to eat at all, right? We start having tummy issues, and it's actually tied to something called, and I can't talk about it today. It's called the solar plexus. Does anyone know what the solar plexus is in your body? So this, I'll just give you a little idea of what it is. It's a bundle of nerves, and it looks like a sun. Like it's radiant, and it sits behind our belly and our spine. And th that's <laughs> so it's it's in it's in it's in touch with all of our organs and our mind. And so in grief, our solar plexus is on high alert. High alert. You can do a little. I didn't bring my book. I have another really good book about the solar plexus, and it impacts us. And our tummies are one of the first things. And you can also know that your throat, oh, it's so dry. Like you can't even swallow, right? That's grief. Headaches, insomnia, it affects our sleep patterns terribly, right? We're sleeping, we're not sleeping, we can't go to sleep, we can't stay asleep, we're waking up at three in the morning. So it's very physical, right? Very physical. And there's even early, this really amazing body of research, and I want to say it came out, say 2000, maybe 2018, 2019, about grief that women, especially, loss of a partner, loss of a soulmate, um, they saw really high rates of fibromyalgia in women. And they, what they noticed about these women, though, is they all had huge loss in their life. And what these women's, women weren't doing was mourning. They were grieving well, and everything was being kept internally, but they weren't expressing their, their grief, expressing their loss. They internalized it. And we know, even now, remember, research is still coming through on grief. Um, even, gosh, even Sandy Hook, they released a new body of knowledge, right? When, when children and teachers killed in their classrooms, we're still learning about trauma. I'm not even going to touch trauma today, because trauma is a whole other lesson. But the research is so profound and how connected it is with our bodies. Behaviorally, it impacts us. We do things, say things that are not our normal selves. Normally, yes. yes. So please know, if you are acting out, you have some what's called protest emotions, where like, this isn't fair, I don't like this, and guess what, I don't like you either. That's protest emotion, right? Or I can't even look at you, don't talk to me right now, right? Grief brings out that in us too. It brings out protest, so know that happens. It also brings out anger. Oh, we get mad, right? And we don't like it. That's another one it brings out. But for most of us, we're taught don't show anger. Don't be mad. Don't let it out. Well, it's the opposite. We should. So if you are feeling that anger and you want to release it, my, my suggestion to you is get a plastic bat, you know, a toy bat, and just hit something, the sofa, a bed. Just get it out of you. If you're mad, it's not good to hold it in. Remember, we want to mourn. And hitting a sofa with a plastic bat is mourning. Mm -hmm. It is. 
Uh, and grief also affects our worldview. Oh God, our worldview shifts. Especially for those of you who've had sudden loss. Or maybe a traumatic loss. You know, someone was taken violently. You know, maybe you've lost faith in the medical system because your loved one died fighting a disease. Right? You used to have faith in hospitals and doctors, and now your loved one died. I want nothing to do with hospitals, doctors anymore. Right? That's very common. Our worldview shifts. Okay? So I have um, put in the next page something called Looking at Life's Domains. This is just a little reflection worksheet for you. And it's just meant for you to kind of look at what you're feeling and thoughts when you do have a loss of any kind, a non-death or death loss. What are you feeling? What are your thoughts? What are your behaviors, beliefs? What is your health like right now? And what is your sense of purpose? Just to help you do a little check-in with yourself. And, and kind of, I'm gonna parlay that with feelings. You know, when we ask one another how we're doing, Usually, what's our usual response? Fine. 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 I'm fine. Right? So, if you are helping someone in grief, and you want to help them better than just asking how they're doing, ask them this instead. Say, how are you surviving? How are you? Now you've changed the whole dialogue. How, how are you surviving? Well, um, God, I, I got up today. Mm, took a shower. I ate breakfast. You know, it, it, forces, it forces that person that you love and care about who's going through the worst thing in their life to be able to open up, you know, to say, this is how I'm, this is how I'm really doing. So that's a good way to change that dialogue, right? And if someone else doesn't have the words, you ask them and they can't come with any words to say, are you just surviving? You could ask them that and they'll go, yeah, I am. I'm really having a hard time today. Oh, you, you know, you can tell me about that. I, I'm here to listen, right? So for you, as you also, as friends and family, you can be compassionate listeners, right? You can offer just, I can't change this, I can't make it better, I can't, it can't go away, but you can talk to me. I'm here to listen. And when we are held in that way, when we're deeply listened to, our grief is witnessed. Our grief is actually seen. It's like, it's like this and there's a light shining on it. And for the person in grief, oh, that's like, they've hit it like just the jackpot. Because that's what we want people to see our grief, right? We want to see it witnessed. And we also want to ask them to say, and you do the same, the name. The name of the person who died. We say their names. We talk about them not as the death or how they died, but who they were. We say their names. So important, right? We say their names in our mind and our heart all day, right? That's our grieving. But to say it aloud, oh, so different. My God, that changes it. Now we've taken them from this abstract concept of death and we've made them real again. Real. So that's something to think about. And when you're thinking about also your feelings, I have this lovely chart that I use. And it just is, help. and there's some up here for you to take today. How are you feeling? And it's all these different emotions. Because grief, there's a lot of emotions, right? Swirling around in our life, whatever that loss is. And know with your emotions, they have one need, and that's to be felt. No emotion is final, and most emotions come in, kind of circulate and percolate for a bit, and then they whoosh out, and then new ones come in. So it's really good to help you identify with how you're feeling. So especially if you're feeling out of sorts or something happened, it's a really good, this is a good check-in for you to bring you back to the present. Because grief also does that. Grief is very future and forward. Grief takes us, how life is going to look? How am I going to get past this? When is it going to get better? 
right? We want, we, we want to bring you back to the present here and not to keep worrying about things that haven't happened. So that's another thing with grief. It's always the future. It doesn't always feel here. Time is very neutral in grief, too. Just know that. So if you are grieving a new loss, time is both slow and fast. It exists and it doesn't exist. It's a very neutral place. And our last truth, number five, is grief shifts our sense of self and identity. So our identity changes, and this takes place over years, right? You may, again, we talked about worldview changing. You also may start to feel, gosh, what I thought was important isn't important anymore. Yeah, this used to be really important to me, but since so-and-so died, or I don't go to my job anymore, or I've moved, it's just not important anymore. That happens a lot in, in a loss. Um, you also might find yourself maybe feeling a little bit more angry or more jaded, maybe cynical. That happens too after loss. You might be more sarcastic, like that's kind of out of character of me, but like nothing really matters. Um, you also, in grief, you may find yourself isolating. You may find yourself kind of pulling away from the people and things you love to do. And that's a part of it too. But, but I think it's important to say, do that for a little bit. And then try to go back to what, what you once loved and did before. Because that being isolated, it's preventing you from having those connections you need to get through life. So we say, like, I don't want to see anybody anymore. I'm just going to stay home and live out the rest of my days and have no contact with anybody. It's not the best thing for you. You need contact. You need engagement. We're, we relate to one another. This is how we do it. So know that our identity changes. And so again, I put a little worksheet here for you to understand your identity, a before and after list. Relational identity, what was I like before and now after, my professional, and that could also include volunteering, know that as well, before and after, my spiritual identity, you know, what did I used to do before and now what I'm doing after, and know with the loss our spirituality shifts and changes, and you might have a hard time even praying, you might have a hard time even talking to God. You may have a hard time sitting in church because that's where you always sat with your loved one. And now you're going to sit there alone and everyone's going to be asking you questions. That shifts too. Those are all big things, in, in our, especially here in our community, right? We all sit in the same places every week. We know our little right neighborhood around in our views, right? And then, gosh, I don't feel like going there because I'm really not up to all the, right, the talk and the questions. Oh my gosh, that happens. And no, you're spiritually, yeah, it might change. You may have found peace and comfort in church, but now you find peace and comfort going for a walk in nature or going to take a walk on the beach, right? Or going to sit in a coffee shop filled with people so you don't feel so alone. That changes. And then financially, yes, losses, all losses can, can change us financially. And so that's a big shift too. And maybe they were the breadwinner. Or maybe you've moved and now have a budget to stick to because you're in retirement. So no, those are big changes as well. But identifying them is really important because it helps you get whatever you're thinking about out, right? So that's just something for you to take home and do. So next is, I want to just talk a little bit about grief concepts, theories, models, and grief types. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but I kind of want to show you how much grief theory has changed and grown in such a short time, and it's still emerging. Even thanatology, that's still an emerging. Most colleges do not have a thanatology program. Most counselors receive less than one month of grief training. Most social workers receive less than three weeks of grief training. So again, we are constantly learning more, and you're going to see thanatology more, right? More and more, um, especially post-COVID. 
So secondary losses, this is really important to know that you have the, the major loss, either the loss of someone you loved or a non-death loss, and then you have millions of secondary losses. So these happen as a result of the primary loss, they have a cumulative effect, and they add to the overall impact of loss. So secondary losses may be concrete and tangible, Maybe, you know, you've um, had to move and you've had to downsize and you've lost a ton of furniture and personal belongings, right? Um, losses related to faith and belief, right? You, um, gosh, you know, you had, we thought, God, we had this kind of pact. I was going to do this, this, and this and, you know, go to church and help everyone and be kind and this shouldn't happen to me. It, sh it shifts our way of thinking. I don't deserve this. I've done all this right. I'm a good person, right? Um, again, I talked about the healthcare system, um, how, um, how we just feel let down, especially when we have someone die. Gosh, I'm just thinking of one man I journeyed with. I journeyed with him for three years and his beautiful wife died from breast cancer. And he had in his home boxes of medical documents. And, and, and he would go through them every day, every other day, trying to find out what went wrong, how his, how his precious wife died, what didn't I do, what did, what did they miss, when did they miss it. For three years he did this. And I'd say, God, we gotta maybe let that go. I'm not going to bring her back, and I know that's hard, and I wish I had answers. I'm, I'm really sorry, and I really witnessed. We just, I tried to be there and witness his loss. And then one day he calls me up, and he said, do you want to come over for a, a barbecue? <laughs> and he had a barbecue and a bonfire. And he burned all those papers. Oh, I happily put them in the fire because he was being shackled, right? He was being held down by grief. He was being right, caught up in that uh, what if, uh, could have, should have, would have. I wish I had done this, why didn't I see this? Because, right, that's always, our, looking back, it's always gonna be clear. It's always gonna be 50-50. Our perception of how they died is gonna shift, right, afterwards. And for him, it was really hard to let go because he also felt really connected to her. And know that happens too. When we're in acute grief, we feel this very strange intimacy and connection with the person who died. And we don't want to let that go because moving on feels like we're leaving them behind. That's a big thing. People get stuck because they don't want to leave them behind. And you don't have to. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So secondary losses, and secondary losses are so important that I did a separate handout on them. So please take one of these because this goes into even more depth. I go into more depth on the impact of secondary losses and what you may be feeling uh, from them and how they exist and relate to your loss. So the next page says your list of losses. Okay, all right. So again, the secondary losses. When you consider the impact of death, divorce, illness, a move, loss of health, or a trauma, um, grieving people are often caught off guard by these ongoing losses and how they compound grief. Secondary losses are seldom formally acknowledged by supportive friends, family, and community members. We've yet to see a sympathy card that reads, I am so sorry to hear you've lost your faith in your funda fundamental belief system. <laughs> or, my most heartfelt sympathies regarding the loss of half your household income. <laughs> right? Or, you know, when a husband or wife dies, I'm so sorry you lost your bed partner. Right? The person who slept with you, you know, next to you. That's a huge secondary loss. Our sleep, in our beds, in our homes. Meals, right? You know, you lose somebody, do you feel like cooking for one or two anymore? Maybe not, right? Oh gosh, you don't want to cook at all. 
yeah, that happens. That's a secondary loss. Uh, secondary losses are often so personal and private that it's difficult to give and receive support for them, right? Think about even like hmm, kind of those looks, private jokes, things you talk about between you guys, between the both of you, You're like a friend or a daughter or a son. Like I could just look, even with Father John, I could just look at him a certain way, he kind of knows what I'm thinking out of you. <laughs> and vice versa. I know, but he's, if he looks at me and he either like looks or rolls his eyes, I'm like, oh brother, yeah, I, I feel it. Like there's like these tiny little, right, these little nuances we all have with different people in our lives. Secondary losses, obliterate, that's one of the things that goes. And like now who am I gonna say? Like, now who can I nudge and say, oh my God, did you see what she's wearing? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a secondary loss. <laughs> or if you lose your dog and you take them for a walk every day at 6.30, and it's 6.30, or you're used to feeding them and the food bowl's there, oh God, that's a secondary loss. See how, how tiny they are, but they're huge. They're huge. Concrete secondary losses are things like losing a home, a business, important objects, your finances, a community, health, and mobility. Now, relational secondary losses are very different. They're like friends who weren't supportive, friend, family, maybe due to a conflict, maybe you have an estrangement. Um, that happens a lot in grief. You know, friends don't know. We don't have a grief language. We're not taught that as children. We don't know how to relate to each other in loss, right? So when we're, we think that, oh, this person's going to be there for me in the way I need them, in the way that they know me best, and they can't show up, oh, that's hard. And knowing loss, there's something called the thirds. So you're going to have a third of the, in your life who are really supportive. They're going to be there for you, they're going to listen to you, be there to talk, take out for coffee, right? They're going to be there. And then you're going to have a third of the people in your life who are neutral. They're just kind of there, right? You see them, it's all good. You kind of pick up where you have, you know, last um, left off. It's all just kind of neutral. And then you have a third of the people who are going to be unhealthy, toxic, harmful, hurtful and say things that don't really help, right? So know that that does happen in grief, that those thirds are real, and you kind of find and seek who's, who's going to be helpful and supportive. And that might take your list down from like having this lovely big group of friends to a very intimate few. That's OK, too. That's OK. That happens. So our relationships, gosh, they change. They suffer in grief, absolutely. And then you also might find yourself thinking, I just always thought that that person, I could go there to them. And maybe you keep finding yourself going to them and expecting to get that sort of support or friendship, um, just kindness, compassion that you, know, that you just expected from them. And they just, they don't bring it, right? They don't bring it. You keep going back and they're just not there for you in the way you need them. So think of this little story I'm going to tell you. And when you find yourself going back and not getting what you need and then going back again to say, now things are going to be different. Now they're going to be there for me, right? Use this little story and this will be your reminder. Okay. So we know Ace Hardware down the street on Benita, right? Okay. We love Ace Hardware down the street. Okay. You could go down to Ace Hardware, and you could go up every aisle, even down where they make the keys, to the back where they sell the stuff, like, yes, all of that, right? And then you're going to leave. And then you're going to go back to Ace Hardware tomorrow. We're going to go back Wednesday and go back Thursday, and we're going to go through every single aisle. You will never be able to buy a gallon of milk at Ace Hardware. But yet, you're going to go back every day to look for that gallon of milk at Ace Hardware, thinking you're going to find it the next day or that next day. That's, there your gallon of milk, right? You're going to go where you can find milk, down the street at Albertsons, right? To where you can get, get it. But yet, as humans, we keep going back to those same people over and over with this 
expectation that they're going to be changed, they're going to be different. Oh, we've now had another loss in our family. Now they're going to get it. And they, poof, it goes right over them again. So that's something to think of, because that's being compassionate to yourself. That's showing yourself self-compassion. You know what? They're really good at going to get pizza and drinks. They're not good at being when I, where I need them in grief. Okay? So that's your gallon of milk story today. Yes. <laughs> and now you're going to, when you see your gallon, when you go to Ace High, you're going to be like, I can't find out. <laughs> um, so on the next page, I just put secondary losses just to make sure you really understand, you know, all those different pieces. And, and again, I have a really great handout for you um, about secondary loss because it's really tied to, the, to loss. And then on the next page, I just wanted to go over this really brief history of, I'm not going to bore you of brief history, brief theory. Oh, we got a, okay, we got it, yeah. We got a helpful group around you. No worries. I think we need a little bit more. Yeah, we'll get something for you. Yeah. Um, brief theory. So I just wanted to just kind of show you um, how far we've come with brief theory in a relatively short time. Okay, so in, 19, in the 1920s, we have Sigmund Freud, and he's, he's, he comes out with his theory, right, uh, to recover from grief, you must express grief and detach emotionally from the deceased. Okay, that's what he says, to detach emotionally from the deceased. Whew, wow. Okay, that was that model of grief, and other people followed that model. So I just wanted to say that because it's generational too. You might have people in your life, you know, that are older, that that they are still working from this sort of model of grief, right? We take the pictures down, we don't talk about them again, and we move on. We erase them. Okay. And then in the 1940s, Lindemann comes along and he says, gosh, we need to be emancipated from the bondage to the deceased. We need to readjust to a brand new environment, and we need to look at new relationships. So often in this time frame too, we see people remarrying very quickly. Okay, just, just kind of just some little history there, right? We know now, yeah, we shouldn't probably remarry right away. We need a little time to process the loss. But back then, that would have been uncommon. It wouldn't have been uncommon to bury somebody and then several weeks later get remarried. Not uncommon at all. Normal. Okay. Then we have, well, we, so four stages. This is the 1960s, right? And he's saying shock and numbness, yearning and searching, despair and disorganization, reorganization and recovery. Now we start to see a shift. We're starting to see a shift in the way we're changing as a society and culture with grief, okay? Right, we're coming out of World War II, we're, coming, we're going into Vietnam, we had a Korea War, and now we're starting to see people come back with, with, with post-traumatic stress dis, um, syndrome, we're starting to come back with trauma, with really uh, just a lot of grief, right? And now researchers start to shift. Kubler-Ross comes in here, right? We talked about the five stages, right, in the 1960s. And then in the 1980s, this is how recent this is, Rando comes out with his six R's of mourning. And this is kind of where we start to see this shift in Rando and Warden, okay? And now we're starting to see what we're doing now, recognizing the loss, right? We're trying to understand our loss, reacting to the separation, right? And so now there's this huge shift, okay? Same with Warden. And it keeps going, and we go to the next page too. Right? Ruben starts this two track model of grief, and I, we, I use that model often in my work, the dual process model of bereavement in the 1990s. So, this is so wonderful because now it's saying we're going back and forth. We're going to the loss, right, to the hard parts, but then we're going to life again. And that's how work, grief does work. It works with this ebb and flow. It works with us not always being in just the trenches of grief, but it also is life going forward too. So we see now this oscillation, right? And it's so beautiful. 
And there's another researcher, I didn't put her here, her name is Lois Tonkian. She's from New Zealand, and she did a lot of work with women who suffered miscarriages, lost pregnancies, dealt with infertility, and Lois, dis Lois found this, and this is one of my favorite grief models. She said grief is, grief to these women basically blotted out their, their life. So imagine there's a circle, and then grief just blacked out the whole circle. But what Lois found when she started working with these women, she found that, yes, that grief is there. But what women did was they built their life bigger around the loss. The loss stays with them. The loss didn't go away, but they made their life bigger around it. And then we have Lois's beautiful model come into play. And that's what we're seeing now. We're saying, we're gonna take this loss with us through life, and we're gonna make our life bigger around it. Oh, it's one of my favorite, favorite models. Lois died about three years ago, but she left us with so many great models of grief. Um, and the other ones would be Dr. Ellen Wolfelt. So great, so many beautiful models. He has the companioning model of grief. We companion, we don't lead, we don't go behind, we just stay to the side, we help them through. David Kessler would be another one, if any of you get a chance, you could listen to David Kessler's podcasts, so good. He worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, beautiful theories of grief. We also have the continuing bonds theory, that's on the next page. And continuing bonds, gosh, this changed everything. Again, it wasn't about letting go or moving on. It was about keeping the bonds stuck together. How, how beautiful, right? That means we keep remembering our loved one. We keep saying their name. We keep um, going back and recalling all those beautiful things. And we have life going forward. Continuing bonds is just wonderful. I love this little caption too. It's like, we don't leave deceased ones behind. Rather, we carry them with us throughout our lives. And then she's saying, can you stay close? Don't we want to say that to all of our loved ones? Can you just stay close? And then also another theory that came out was Shattered Assumptions. Um, this, there's, this book is here. Um, it's really wonderful. It, it really talks, and this is a whole other talk about our assumptive world. Right? Because all of us have a sort of worldview or understanding of how life looks. And when loss is interjected into that worldview, our life view, it shatters our natural assumptions on how safe the world and life is. And this book really talks about it. It helps us say, yeah, um, we're not so secure day to day, right? Um, uh, it, it also talks about, I put this, that the world I'm living in since I lost my loved one is so different. It does not align with my beliefs, right? We can say that every time. Well, here's an example of what happened yesterday in Nashville, right? We expect children to go to school and learn and have relationships and have play, right? And, and be safe in their community. And then something again happens and it disrupts our whole world view again. This isn't right. This isn't fair. This shouldn't happen. Right? It just changes. Who, you know, so know that our world, it's always getting changed. Our assumptions are always getting shattered. This is a really great book to read. Um, I didn't bring mine with me. I think I have it at home. Um, but it's a good one to kind of just like look through. Um, also a couple other things. Um, if I treat others kindly, this is what it says in the book, then um, I'm going to be treated well. We know that's not the case, right? Um, <laughs> um, if I'm a good parent, my kids will have a certain kind of life. Uh -huh. um, if I work hard, I will get what I deserve. So that's, that's, that's Shattered Assumptions, really great book. So on the next page is just, again, self-reflection for you all. Um, you know, when you have loss, um, what have, what's changed, right? What's changed in yourself? In what ways? Um, you know, have your beliefs about the order of the world, your purpose, your own meaning, has that changed? Um, uh, has my belief that other people have changed? How? Um, 
all right, do I feel unsafe in this world? Do I feel at risk, right? Have there been other changes in my worldview? Those are good things when something happens, either community, um, in, uh, in our nation. These are good questions to ask yourself to help you be a little bit more grounded because it's really easy to go to that fear side, right? Really fast. We can go to fear and tap in. And that's kind of in that, that really ancient part of our brain, the fight, flight, or freeze. And it's embedded there. Our, our frontal lobe basically turns off reasoning and we go back here. And our mind's saying, you're not safe. You're not secure. You're gonna stay here, you're gonna, you're gonna fly away, or you're gonna freeze and pretend no one sees you. Um, considerations for grief counseling or even therapy. You know, I just want you to know that uh, what we're doing today is grief support. This is what I do every month. I know a lot of people have maybe some assumptions already about grief support. This is grief support, what we're doing today. Uh, and so it's good if you feel like you need an extra help, it's good to reach out. Maybe good to reach out to a counselor or maybe a therapist just to talk, to see another perspective, to get another opinion, um, to have someone listen to you. It's really, really important. Um, and I just, just, this is just, you know, most people, this is a high number, 85 to 90 percent, they adapt without intervention, right? If they have normalization, validation, social support, um, and some people have to go to a grief counselor, that's okay, or even grief support. It might not be, remember, it's for now, not forever. For now, not forever. It's what you need to get you over to that next piece, and that's really good. Um, the next page is just the pro, um, center. It's called Prolonged Grief Acronym. And there's something called Prolonged Grief or when grief gets stuck. And so if you find yourself maybe in that third or fourth year of grief, really not making progress, you may have prolonged grief. You may need that extra help. Maybe grief counselor, maybe therapy, maybe a support system. And so these are just, I just listed what we know with prolonged grief that you might be feeling, okay? And I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go down to E where it says excessive avoidance of reminders. If you're now like not driving a certain way because you used to go to that maybe restaurant with your loved one and you're taking a whole out of the way place so you don't see it, then yeah, you might be using avoidance in your grief style. You know, or you might put all the pictures away and you can't even dare look at a photo. That might be something, it uh, might not be where you should be at. Um, and then stigmatizing statements, I have told myself or others have told me. You know, know that we're really hard on ourselves in grief. We're not compassionate and kind in, in grief. And so you could think about maybe what you're telling yourself in your grief. It's really good to be able to say, gosh, why am I telling myself this? You know, if you were, let's say, you know, your loved one died um, in a car crash. Uh, if I had been in the car, they wouldn't have died, right? Or if I had not let them go, they wouldn't have got killed. Or if I had just called them. If you're ruminating on that, definitely that self-blame, oh, that also impacts your grief journey. So know that that is really important to kind of understand what, what are you telling yourself? Is this healthy? And then on the next page, I just want to talk about the benefits of support groups. You know, it's, they're not for everybody. Um, they are basically really to receive information, uh, give and receive support, connect with other people with similar experiences, um, and instill hope. You know, we, that's really important. When we're gathered as community and we're going through the grief together, wow, that makes a big difference. You feel like not so alone, right? Um, and then also with support groups, for some people, it can be overwhelming and discouraging. Um, some groups, you get misinformation or bad advice. Um, you may feel judged by others. It is not the same as therapy. It is not the same as one-on-one -on -one counsel. Um, and you ha sometimes have to try more than one group before finding the right fit. That happens too with that. Okay. Um, so if you do find the barriers and stuck points, that's next. 
and you're not coping with grief, know you should reach out. Reach out to our priests. Reach out to a deacon. Or you could reach out to me. You know, if you're feeling like these are some things I've been thinking about and I don't feel like I'm making progress, check in with somebody. And you have great resources here. We have such pastoral, compassionate priests. They will listen to you, help you, instill that in you, that hope piece. Uh, the next page, um, I, I really went into more depth for all of you about these pieces like guilt, regret, fear and anxiety, relief, that happens a lot in grief, feeling okay, conflicting emotions, um, because there's a lot of different aspects and you might be feeling like a lot of guilt with the death, you know. And how can we, you know, how could, what would I say? Well, definitely self-care, forgiveness, making amends, understanding the difference between guilt and regret, right? Um, conflicting emotions. Gosh, there were so many emotions going on. And avoidance, too. You know, some people just can't even imagine thinking about the grief, thinking about the loss, thinking about the death, thinking about how they died. That's very common in grief. So this is just some little definitions for you to take into consideration with grief. Um, and it is, um, when we talk about avoidance in regards to grief, um, I just want to really kind of just make sure you understand that. We're usually experiencing this kind of need to block out reduce or change unpleasant thoughts, emotions, or bodily sen sensations. Um, so know when you're really avoiding grief, like you aren't letting anything happen and you're really staying more, you know, like everything's fine, I'm happy, um, I don't have to really deal with this, it's gonna go away. Um, know that avoidance in grief, <laughs> you can get stuck in that. Um, and it can also lead to isolation. So just a little bit, I wanted to expand more on that because that's something that we're really good at avoiding. Really good at avoiding. And avoiding pain. Avoiding something we don't want to touch. Um, and then I put, lastly, it is okay for you to be okay. Um, and then just questions related to being okay. Like, what would that mean if you were okay? Right? You can be okay and be in grief. You can always be both. Um, so know that that is normal too, okay? And then on the next page, we have grief-related coping. And so coping is important because coping is how we get through, right? So questions like, how have you coped in the past with loss? Where, what are your preferences when to cope? What are your strengths with your coping? Are you emotional? Are you creative? And are you rational? and know you're going to maybe be a little bit of both. So an emotional coper, they're going to let it out. They're going to cry, get mad. They're going to label their emotions. They're going to talk to someone, see a therapist, attend a support group. They're going to explore their feelings and make amends. So some of you could relate to that. You have done a couple of things like this, right? Others are creative. They want to draw, paint, maybe photography, write, listen to music. Maybe see an art therapist, learn a new creative skill, look to work at others, connect with other creative people. And then others are even rational. Learn grief theory, read self-help books, journal, write, see a therapist, volunteer, be an advocate, educate others. So we, I, please know that we kind of go back and forth in all of these rounds of coping. Um, we don't usually just stick to one. Um, and then that leads us to your grief support needs. Um, identifying your needs after a loss can be a lot harder than you'd expect. Like so many things in grief, the needs you experience after a loss are often complex and diverse. They may change from day to day, week to week, and month to month. So it's only logical um, that in order to get help meeting your needs, you need to first figure out what those needs are. Some of your needs will be obvious, others less so. Some will be concrete, tangible, others will be more abstract. And to determine your needs, it can be helpful to consider nine domains. These are the nine domains that are commonly impacted. 
So again, emotional needs, finding that good support system to be able to talk about your emotions and express them. Your spiritual needs, how maybe that's changed after the loss, right? Have someone to understand that too. Your practical needs, um, maybe you're not eating and you need someone to help you with that, right? Maybe they need to remind you or remind you to do things. That happens. Because also know in practical needs, um, we become very, um, we go in what's called grief fog. We, um, it's hard to absorb information. It's hard to remember things. Grief impacts us in the sense we can't even sometimes remember where we're going, what someone's name is, certain dates. So we might need help in that department. That's, that's really important. Uh, physical or health-related needs, you know, make sure you get your annual physical. Make sure you check in with your doctor. Make sure they're seeing you every year to see how you're doing. Um, checking in with your mental health, your well-being needs, financial, your remembrance needs, and creativity. Um, so know the remembrance needs piece. That continues. You know, after we lose somebody, it's kind of not a one and done, right? A funeral, a memorial. We need different rituals to help us get through. So, in speaking about ritual, um, ritual gives us something to do when we don't know what to do. Ritual gives us something to do when we don't know what to do. And in grief, we don't know what to do. So when we lean into ritual, when we lean into that, it gives a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. So a ritual would be, I don't know if anyone went down to Monterey Park to see the huge uh, display of flowers after the Chinese New Year shooting. I went because that's a ritual. And to see hundreds of flowers and notes and signs is to honor that loss. So that's a ritual. Even when someone is killed, maybe on a bike, right? And we see those little remembrances on the side of the road, right? That's a ritual. Because they have, they have such profound pain, they don't know what to do with their loss. So what do they do? They make something. They're creative. They put something that's there that says, this person lived and mattered. We have so many of those beautiful memorials, in our country especially, right? Those remembrances, so important, because we just don't know what to do in times of loss. So no, that could be gathering to pray a novena, to pray a rosary. That could be lighting a candle up in front of a picture of your loved one every night and saying a couple things you're thankful for. That's a ritual. Um, it could be visiting their favorite place, favorite restaurant. Um, that's another ritual. So know that those rituals, whatever they might be, are really important. Uh, and being creative, and that kind of leads also from ritual, being creative. And then finally, just conceptualizing your progress. I just put this little lovely note here. You know, a grief can make us say like, oh my gosh, I have so much further to go. But when reality, we can say, wow, look how far I've come, right? We want to look back and say, gosh, I've really made some strides here. Especially knowing that grief, you know, and this is something to know too in grief, whatever we run from pursues us. Grief will pursue us. But we have the chance to turn around and confront it, and there's the possibility of transformation. That's, that's a big part of grief. If we keep running from it, it's always going to be just grief behind us. And then it spills out into everything we do, our relationships, our physical well-being, how we see the world. But when we deal with it in a really healthy coping way, coping style, um, we're able to move through and create that bigger life that Lois tells us, right? We carry the, the loss in our life and we build our life bigger around it and we carry it with us, right? So with all of our losses, our death and non-death losses, honoring them, talking about them, remembering them, and however you do it as a griever is really important. And know you have ongoing support here at Holy Nima Mary, right? This month, grief support, this Saturday, 9.15, in the hall, we're talking about crazy. 
Crazy and grief. Why we go crazy and grief? Why it makes us feel crazy? That's our topic, right? So always know there's a lot more to learn. I'm always learning, and my best um, teachers are you. I learn from the mourners. I learn from the families, right? I'm always learning different styles, different family of origins, different issues. Okay. So that's a lovely grief 101 overview <laughs> of grief. Um, just to give you a little taste of it to help you understand it. Um, and well, let me ask: Is there any questions? Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. What was Lois's last name? Tonkin. T-O-N-K-I-E-N. -E She's from New Zealand. T-O-N-I-E-N? K. Okay. K-I-E-N. Lois Tonkin. And she's from New Zealand. Uh, she's a psychotherapist, and she did a lot of work with women in miscarriage and um, infertility. Thank you. Yes. There was one more person at that same time that you mentioned that I didn't get. An author. Was it David Kessler, Ellen Wolfelt, Joanne Cacciatore? Ellen. Ellen Wolfelt. So Dr. Ellen Wolfelt is marvelous, and he's put out a lot of a lot of grief um, books. He has a center called the Center for Loss, um, and that's in Colorado. And I've done one-on-one -on -one trainings with him, so he's one of my mentors. I really love working with with uh, Dr. Wolfelt. Wolfelt. W O L. F-E-L-T. And I feel like I might have one of his books here too. So I, I just, I brought just a couple books for you to, um, I know not all of you are readers. I don't want to overwhelm you. I love reading, um, but I know everyone, nobody, not everyone feels the same. So this is by David Kessler. Um, he finished, uh, he wrote this book, this came out uh, about a year and a half ago called Finding Meaning. He wrote that sixth stage of grief. He worked with Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and as you can see, I love this book. <laughs> I teach a lot from this book. It's one of my one of my favorites. So this book is so beautiful. This is book is really for people who are two, three, four more years outside of grief. This wouldn't be for someone in early grief. This is definitely your further along in your grief. I'm gonna leave them here for you. You can take pictures of them. So that's a really great book. Um, this is Dr. Ellen Wolfell. I use this book a lot. Again, you can see that's copy. Um, this is um, when your soulmate dies. So I offer soulmate loss at 11 o'clock the first Saturday of every month. And I use a lot from Alan. And I was just with him in December. Um, gosh, we had a really great, uh, great training. So Alan would be great, great. For those of you who want something more reflective, Jan Richardson, She's an audit, um, artist and author. She wrote this beautiful book called Sparrow about the loss of her husband, Gary, and the cure for sorrow. This is so lovely. These are prayers. This is all prayer and reflection. Uh, Jan, I, I've been on retreat with Jan several times. She's a Methodist minister. She's, she writes beautifully. She paints beautifully. And this is a really lovely book, beautiful. Um, this is Kubler-Ross's book on death and dying. This is my book from, from college. <laughs> it's an oldie. It was $1.95. <laughs> and, um, and then she, so, and then this is a great workshop too. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross put out this book, Working It Through. This is really wonderful. It, it goes back and forth with spirituality, religion, and psychology. Another really good book. And of course, C.S. Lewis, A Grief Observed. Beautiful. Another one of my books from college. Love this book too. So those are some of the books. So I'm gonna, and then, okay, anxiety. If any of you suffer from severe anxiety, I didn't even go into that realm with you. This is a great book about anxiety and grief and change. How change just acts up our anxiety and helps. This is a really helpful book. Questions? Yes. I just want to comment how marvelous, oh. what an amazing woman, learner, and teacher you are. Thank you. I'm always learning. I love that. I am. 
am. I am. I'm still, yes, still learning. I'm still, I'm finishing up my graduate program, so I'm still in a, I'm in a new one. I know, I don't learn. I keep thinking this will be my last one. Um, I'm in my third one. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. There's a lot more to learn. So please take a look, and then I'm going to have those handouts for you. I have a a brief support schedule for the rest of the year. I have how do you feel today and then that beautiful handout on secondary losses and I'll put them on the counter here for you. Yes, Emma? Since your meetings are here in the church, do you prefer Catholic uh, can they be from other religions? Yes, so know that the group that I have on Saturdays come from a lot of our neighboring parish, our churches and communities. And so we have a lot from Presbyterian. I have some from Church of the Brethren. Uh, yeah, the Lutheran Church as well. Yeah, we have lots of folks from lots of different places. There's not brief support in our area, or not, uh, not enough. Yes? Oh, which resource in terms of reading would be helpful for someone that is going through secondary loss right now and eventually will be a loss of their loved one? And that's for me. <laughs> okay. So are you a caregiver? Uh, my husband, yes. Okay. So I have a, a little different book for you. It's not here, but I can recommend, if I get your name and number, I can okay. recommend that resource for you. Oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So that's called anticipatory grief, right? And we do that a lot with when we have someone dying from illness, right? Or long-term caregivers, dementia. It's dementia. Uh, yes. Body. So anticipatory loss, it's, again, that's very forward thinking, and I can help help you with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andy. With an eye. I'll ask later. Okay. Anything, anyone else? Brenda, thank you so much for that. Brenda, a very young friend who lost her husband, just been and dropped dead in November. And she went through all the stages you're saying, and I just did not know her help her at all. It's like, oh, go to disregard for God, why did God do this to me? My husband did everything. He went for all his checkups, and so it was very, very hard. So now at least I have a better understanding. Yes. So you help her. Absolutely. And let her go through those stages, right? God is so big and wonderful, powerful. God can take it, right? And it's okay to question and be angry and lament. Right? I, I don't, oh, I did bring that one. Lament. Yeah, like just to be able to say, why God? Why me? How did this happen? What did I do to deserve it? Those are questions we should be saying out loud. Right? We should be doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Brenda, the other thing that I was thinking about as, as you were going through this grief and loss are the other. Um, deaths that we're going through, memory loss, physical loss, uh, and all of those. Yes. I think non-death losses. Yes. 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 There's yes. so much more about that. Okay. So much more. So yes. Yeah. So physically, like those losses, with mobility. Yeah, all of that. That that I really went to more death losses, but the non-death losses, I have a lot more information about. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. So I think you'd uh, agree that uh, we have a wonderful resource here at Holy Name. Oh, so we're very, yes. very fortunate uh, to have Brenda the, uh, in the parish and all the work she does. So uh, I think she's a tremendous resource. I'll trip on that. Yeah. Oh, you're Okay. So the, uh, I think you'd agree that we have a tremendous resource here in Brenda, and she does fantastic work. And so, uh, I think we we'll go round of applause. Aww, thank done. you. So much. It reminded me of the uh, policeman and uh, he ran the sergeant, and he says, "Sergeant." He says, I've got a woman here who shot her husband because he walked on her wet floor. And he says, have you arrested her? Says, no, the floor's still wet. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, 
So I'm sure you have uh, a lot of questions uh, to ask uh, Brenda and that. And so, uh, so you can always uh, drop into the office and she's always there. And, uh, and so, uh, thanks Brenda again, because what she could, you know, she could have been doing this for three weeks and we'd still got to scratch me. Yeah, it's a <laughs> So thanks again to Brenda. Thank The uh, first funeral I went to uh, was uh, Ford, was my grandfather. And uh, I thought that, you know, because the, the family was standing at the edge of the, the grave, and I thought the priest said, in the name of the Father, Son, and in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> say one last thing I forgot to say this earlier. If any of you would like to receive my weekly grief meditations, I'm, I'm sending them out, uh, what's today too? Sending them out tomorrow. It's just a short little read. I know, Father, you have emails. Um, I don't know how we can do this, Marilyn, but maybe you could, we could do a list. But I send it out to about 2,000 people. Um, they're just a great way to check in with loss. And they're short. They're, they're maybe two minutes at the most. For those of you who don't like to read, they're perfect for you. <laughs>